In the fabric of American history lies a dark and often silenced chapter, the Black Holocaust. This term, evocative and contentious, refers to the centuries-long atrocity of slavery in the United States. The history of slavery is one of evil. These innocent men and women suffered terribly. They were tortured, forced to labor every hour of every day, and treated like sheep or cattle, bought and sold as though they were livestock. In law, they were property, with no more rights than an inanimate object. Many female slaves were forcibly traded to serve as concubines or in prostitution. They were reduced to the status of an organic machine. For over 300 years, generation after generation lived in bondage, at the every whim of their masters and overseers. While the Holocaust changed the world's understanding of genocide, the Black Holocaust represents a parallel narrative of racial extermination and cultural obliteration, hidden in plain sight, yet frequently overlooked by mainstream media and historical discourse. Between 1525 and 1866, over 17 million black Africans were transported to the New World to live and work as slaves. The trade began in the 16th century, with the Portuguese being the first to purchase men and women from West African slave traders. In 1526, the first ship arrived in Brazil, establishing the transatlantic slave trade. The trade in black Africans was authorized with a papal blessing, on the basis that those enslaved were converted to Christianity, justifying the action by claiming to have saved the souls of heathen Africans. Other European powers soon followed, with the quantities of slaves being sold growing year by year. Thus began a dark period of human history, which would continue for over 300 years. Slaves were used as human machinery. Most did menial agricultural labor, such as harvesting and sowing crops, digging drainage and irrigation ditches, or processing cotton, tobacco, and sugarcane. In some areas, slaves worked in factories, producing manufactured goods, as domestic servants and nannies, or in construction. Any job that could not be done cheaply with machinery was viable work for an enslaved individual. When the first Portuguese traders arrived in Africa, they discovered an already established slave economy. Intertribal warfare meant there was a surplus of war prisoners, and these prisoners were being sold and traded amongst other African and Arab slave traders. Others might be sent into slavery as collateral for a debt or to pay tribute to a local chieftain or king. European entry into the market led to an increase in slave raids, as one tribe attacked another so as to sell them into slavery. Journey to the New World The journey overseas to America was perilous, with as many as 25% dying on the voyage. Disease and malnutrition were the leading causes of death, as hundreds of people were kept chained below deck in filthy conditions and without access to proper food or enough water. Dysentery, called the bloody flux, was rife, as the men and women were forced to defecate themselves, spreading disease among them. Other diseases, such as scurvy and smallpox, were also transmitted amongst those on board, both crew and cargo. This journey, called the Middle Passage, was often longer than seven weeks. The men and women were separated. Women were often left free, while the men were tightly chained together, laying shoulder to shoulder on the floor, left to lie for weeks in the vomit, mucus, and feces of themselves and their fellow captives. Those transported rarely had enough space to move at all, and were often confined in such small spaces that they were forced to crouch for the entire voyage. To keep order and prevent slave rebellions, as the slaves on board often vastly outnumbered the crew members, they were often beaten and whipped. While all slaves on board these ships were subject to horrific abuses, women were especially vulnerable to sexual violence from crew members. Seasoning After landing, enslaved Africans underwent the final process to establish their enslavement, called seasoning. This process was intended to separate the weak from the strong and to ensure that those slaves sold were able to survive in this new environment. Having traveled thousands of miles, many were not able to adjust to the new climates, diseases, and diets. It was also used to rid them of any remaining hope of freedom. To prepare them for their new work, they were harshly taught how to do agricultural labor or other tasks that might be required of them. Slaves undergoing seasoning were also subject to intense violence. Men and women were beaten and tortured, sometimes for a supposed transgression, though often for no reason at all, other than to further subjugate them. They were also taught the language of their new masters, 
whether that be Spanish, Portuguese, or English. As a way to rebel against their new lot in life, many people committed suicide or starved themselves, though those refusing to eat were punished. Suicide was a real worry for the slave traders, and various manuals circulated on how to best improve a slave's disposition to prevent them from killing themselves. The Slave Market After the seasoning, when those slaves that could not survive their new lives had died, it was time for the sale. It was here that families were torn apart, mothers and fathers from their children and from each other, as some may not want to purchase the whole family. Most slaves were sold via auction to the highest bidder. The men and women for sale would stand on a podium as prospective buyers carried out an inspection, poking and prodding, looking inside the mouth, trying to decide on a value. Young and healthy slaves fetched the highest prices. In contrast, the elderly, young children or sick individuals would usually sell for less. To make them appear healthier than they were, these slaves were often coated in grease or tar. The other method of sale was the scramble, or grab and go. Those up for sale were confined in a small pen, with those hoping to buy standing outside. At a given signal, often a gunshot or drumbeat, the gates would open and buyers would rush in, trying to grab the slaves they most wanted to buy. Slaves could be physically torn between two buyers who were competing for the fittest, most muscular, most desirable slaves. This method was most common in the West Indies, but also occurred in North America. Work Most enslaved people worked as field slaves. They sowed and harvested crops and did other farm labor, such as building fences, dredging rivers, and digging irrigation ditches. They worked from sunrise to sunset, or as they called it, can see to can't see. The work was hard and quotas were harshly enforced. They would be subject to brutal punishments if they did not harvest enough cotton or tobacco or fell enough trees. Not all slaves worked at menial jobs, though. Plantations needed skilled carpenters, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, and other trades. A professional tradesman was expensive, and so slaves would be apprenticed off to older slaves in the area to learn their new skill. While most female slaves worked in the fields alongside the men, many were used as domestic servants. They prepared food, did laundry and housework, washed dishes, and sometimes even taught the slaveholders young children. While these people may have had slightly better living conditions, often living in a small annex or a room in the house, their constant presence meant they were often victims of sexual violence from their masters. While there were a few select locations where slaves had some modicum of personal rights, in most, they were considered personal property no different to a horse or wagon, and so there were no limits as to what their captor could do to them. Some slaves worked in industrial settings, such as tobacco processing plants, shipyards, laundries, or ironworks. The Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia had a workforce of 750 slaves in 1860. Some of these men were directly owned by the factory, though most were rented from local slave owners. This factory and its enslaved workers produced most of the artillery used by the Confederate States during the Civil War. As the world was quickly changing, slave labor in mass industry was believed by some to be the future. Many female slaves were bought and sold specifically to be used as concubines or prostitutes. These women and girls were referred to as fancy girls or fancy ladies. There was no age limit, and there is record of a 13-year-old girl being sold as nearly a fancy. These tended to be the only slaves that commanded a higher price than skilled, healthy male workers. Punishment As slaves were not paid, slaveholders needed other ways to incentivize them to work hard. They achieved this through torture, through whippings, beatings, and other violent acts. On most plantations, the slave population greatly outnumbered the white masters, so this extreme violence was deemed necessary to prevent violent uprisings or rebellions. The most common and most widely known torture device was the whip. These whips were made from animal hide. Those used by the Portuguese and Belgians in Africa often used rhinoceros hide, whereas those used in America were cowhide, with a wooden or hard leather handle. Slave overseers could get quite imaginative with their methods. Some whips may have had multiple thongs, flexible part used for striking, and some would even add thorns or sharp pieces of metal to dig deeper into the flesh of those being punished. Whippings could result in serious injury, sometimes permanent, 
Even without any sharp edges, a heavy stroke of a whip could dig deep into the flesh, causing long, bloody wounds. Some slaves could be sentenced to over 100 lashes, which could result in serious internal injury. Slaves were often temporarily incapacitated after receiving lashes, sometimes permanently. But the main reason was to deter the other slaves from committing the same offense. To prevent loss of labor, large numbers of lashes were often administered in multiple bouts over days or weeks. This gave the wounds time to heal, meaning the slave could still perform his duties. To prevent infection and add even more pain to the procedure, the fresh wounds were often packed with salt. The box, or hot box, was a particularly cruel method of torture. The offending man or woman would be placed in a small enclosed cell directly under the hot sun, a form of solitary confinement that could be confined here for days on end with either none or very little food and water. This was used to break the spirit of the most rebellious slaves as they were driven right to the brink of death by heat stroke, dehydration, starvation, and the mental anguish of solitary confinement. Mutilation was another practice. Many overseers branded the men with the initials of their master to identify them if they ever tried to escape. Ear cropping and teeth removal were also used, often on recaptured runaways. One slave at Cape Girardeux had the words, a slave for life, branded on his forehead with a hot iron. Sexual violence was another popular method of torture, used either as punishment for an offense or merely to satisfy the master or overseer's violent urges. Both male and female slaves fell victim to rape. When female slaves fell pregnant to their captors, their children were often kept in slavery, no different from a child born between two slaves. One horrific account tells of a male slave 30 years old who had his genitals nailed to the bedstead. He was then whipped until the pain caused him to pull away, ripping his genitals off. Over the first half of the 19th century, attitudes towards slavery slowly changed. Britain would abolish the slave trade in 1807 and free every slave within the empire by 1838. The nations of Europe would follow soon after, as would those in South America, such as Brazil. American slaves would only receive their freedom after a brutal, bloody war, a war in which many slaves fought. Though seeming like an age ago, the last living African-American man to have been enslaved, Sylvester McGee, would not pass away until 1971. He was born into slavery, but lived to hear the Emancipation Proclamation, to see the dark days of the Jim Crow era, and finally, the enlightenment of the Civil Rights Movement.